Holy God, we pray that you would speak your words to us tonight. May the words of my mouth and the meditations on all of our hearts be acceptable to you. For you, O Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Last Monday night, uh, Dwight and I realized, as we were kind of taking um, inventory of what we needed for the week, that we were out of bread and milk, even though we'd just been to the grocery store the day before. Now, if you remember what last Monday the forecast was calling for, you can imagine the scene that Dwight met at the store. It was an absolute zoo, with everyone trying to get their grocery stopping in before the storm hit. There were tons and tons of people in the store. It was hard to get around the aisles because the lines for the checkout were so long that they extended all the way down some of the aisles. People in their carts were parked in front of the shelves trying to stay out of the way and leave room for people to get by, but still blocking the way of people who actually wanted to get something off of the shelf. I'm sure that you can picture it in your head with me, right? We've all been there. People being reasonably nice to each other, making small talk in line to pass the time, but also that powerful undertow of annoyance in everyone's conversation. Everyone is annoyed to be waiting in such a crowded line, annoyed to be crammed in such a tight space, annoyed that they only need a few items, but you have to wait half an hour to check out. Now, what I am struck by when I think about this scene is that happens every time there's snow predicted is how spoiled and pampered we are in America. How when the weatherman predicts even the slightest hint of bad weather, we were just at the grocery store right before this, so I know there's people out now, people with already packed refrigerators and cupboards rush out to the store to stock up on even more food. And Dwight and I were certainly guilty of it. We could have gone without the bread and the milk for two days. But just the thought of not being able to get out of our house for a day or two sends us into panic mode, suddenly terrified that the excess we already have is isn't going to be enough. Dr. Kelly Flanagan, a psychologist and author, says it this way, inundation always ends with a sense of deprivation. He goes on to talk about how more choices, more stuff, more abundance leads to a growing sense of scarcity within us. Every year, we know, the holidays remind us that the more we have, the more we want. That was Kmart's commercial two years in a row, Get More Christmas. The busiest shopping day of the year is the day after Christmas, after you've opened your presents already. Dr. Flanagan concludes with this really profound thought that has me thinking this week. We keep trying to satisfy our hunger for more by feeding it, but it's only making us hungrier. We shouldn't be feeding it, we should be starving it. It's the same message, I think, that we hear in the gospel reading tonight. Jesus tells his disciples, when you give to the needy and when you pray, Jesus assumes that his disciples are already doing these things. And we all know we could do those things better, so we listen and we nod our heads as Jesus talks, trying to gleam some extra tidbit from Jesus about how to do those things more or better or with better results. But Jesus doesn't stop with just those two instructions. Now, I think most of us kind of wish he would, but he keeps going. Jesus even says the F word, fasting. It's a dirty word for many of us, even in the church, because we don't like to think about fasting and we don't like to talk about it because it seems obsolete and pointless to us, one of those relics of bygone eras where people were looking for any way that they could connect with God, something that we don't really need to do anymore. But unfortunately for us, Jesus doesn't treat fasting that way. Jesus takes for granted that his disciples will be doing these things, that they will be giving to the needy, that they will be praying, that they will be fasting. And you'll notice that Jesus doesn't even take uh, time to waste time to convince them the importance of fasting. He doesn't try to convince them that they need to do those three things. He assumes they are already doing them. When you do these things, he says, don't do them for public approval. The Bible, when we look, is full of examples of fasting. In the Old Testament, Moses fasted 40 days on behalf of Israel's sin. Several fasts of King David are recorded, primarily surrounding the death of significant persons in his life. Esther fasted, as did Ezra, Nehemiah, and Elijah. In the New Testament, Jesus fasted 40 days after his baptism and before the beginning of his ministry. The disciples of John the Baptist, we're told, fasted. Paul fasted three days after his Damascus Road version, and that is just a few of the biblical records of individual fasts. 
We also know that the people of Israel were called upon to fast communally together, especially once a year on the Day of Atonement when they reflected on their sins of the past year and were called to repent. Fasting was part of the repentance. It was bringing the body as well as the mind and the heart and the soul into the process of discomfort over sin and desire to turn another way. As one theologian describes it, fasting was then and should be now a whole body's natural response to life's sacred moments. Fasting isn't about looking good in front of other people. It's not about proving to yourself or anyone else how holy you really are or how strong your will is. It's not even about penance, really, or about sacrifice or denying yourself. Fasting is at its heart about creating empty space where God can enter in. During Lent, many people will be giving something up. Maybe you've already decided what yours will be. It's another way of saying that they are observing a partial fast. Maybe for you it's going to be chocolate or dessert or soda or Facebook or TV. Maybe it's complaining or negativity like we've done in years past or gossip. Regardless of what it is that we fast from, the point is always the same. Fasting is about creating empty space so that God can enter in. Theologian Thomas Stiegold says it this way, we make these small temporary sacrifices not because God requires it, but because we desire the kind of deep intimacy that only empty space can begin to harbor. Psalm 51, the one that we read just a few moments ago, reminds us of the same thing. God doesn't want our sacrifices. God wants a closer and deeper relationship with us. So what I have come to learn about fasting is that it is the spiritual discipline that joins our body with our mind and our spirit in a devotional life to God. Especially when it is accompanied by prayer, it is an expression of our whole selves. It joins our material and physical body to our immaterial and invisible spirit. Scott McKnight, a writer and theologian, says it this way, Fasting is the body talking what the spirit yearns, what the soul longs for, and what the mind knows to be true. Fasting or Lenten disciplines are not about sacrifice for the sake of sacrifice. They are about removing the things that stand in the way of our relationship with God. It is about at least temporarily starving our desire for more, more stuff, more choices. It's about learning to be content with what we have because God is all we really need. And because paradoxically, the more we have, the more we want. Lent and its disciplines are about learning to say no to all the things we use that fill that void in our lives. Food and alcohol and clothes and eating out and electronics and social media and criticism. Lent is about learning how to starve those things in our lives so that we can rediscover what we are truly hungry for. During Lent, our sermon series will be called The Valley of Shadows. Traditionally, during Lent, we talk about the growing shadow of the cross that looms on the horizon for Jesus. So during the six weeks of Lent, we make a slow march towards that cross that we know awaits Jesus and those who choose to follow him. And as the shadows lengthen, we'll be spending each week talking about a different shadow in our lives. Shadows are caused by light hitting an object that the light cannot pass through. We see shadows most often when the object is between us and the light, causing the shadow to fall on us or at least in our line of vision. It makes sense then that the things that cast shadows in our spiritual lives are the things that come between us and God. So part of Lent, then, is about being attentive to the shadows in our lives and reflecting on what objects need to be moved so that the light of Christ can shine through. Sometimes the things that cause shadows in our lives are bad things, things that in and of themselves cause brokenness and pain in our lives and the lives of those we love, things like lying or addiction, temptation, isolation, or self-righteousness. But other times, perhaps just as often, the things that cause shadows in our life are good things that either have been misused or given too high a priority in our lives. 
things like work or money, food, our houses, even our children, sometimes even the good things, when placed between us and God, create shadows in our spiritual lives. So it seems appropriate that on this Ash Wednesday, the beginning of Lent, we talk about the shadow of abundance. God lavishes good and life-giving things on us, but we have to be careful that we do not begin to love the gift more than the giver. That's really what fasting and Lenten disciplines are about. They help us to remember where to direct our love. In her book, Mudhouse Sabbath, Lauren Winner, a woman who was raised Jewish and converted to Christianity, reflects on a variety of spiritual disciplines that both religions share. And one of those is fasting. She shared that growing up Jewish, there were particular holy days of the year when an observant Jew is expected to fast. She notes in her book that she really struggled with fasting, and she recalled one particular high holy day when she complained to her rabbi about it. She said to him, this is a day more than any other day when we are supposed to be reflecting on God. Wouldn't that be easier if I weren't thinking about how hungry I am? Her rabbi said to her, hunger is part of the point. When you are fasting, he said, and you feel hungry, you are to remember that you are really hungry for God. Ultimately, I think Lent is about repositioning. It reminds us of our dependence on God, of our need for forgiveness and love and grace and the light that brings life. Any Lenten discipline that we undertake this year ought to be about that repositioning. As we begin Lent, we're going to give you just a few moments to reflect on where the shadows are in your own life and what kind of repositioning you need to do to let more of the light shine in our life. Even though during the next six weeks of Lent, the shadows seem to get deeper and darker and longer and more sinister, we dare to walk through them together because we know that as the psalmist tells us, God is with us even in the valley of the shadow of death. And we know that on the other side, the dawn is rising. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.